Good afternoon, Mr. Parker. Well, good afternoon, Godwin. And how are you today? I'm doing fine, Mr. Wright Sam. Mm -hmm. Doing just fine. Good, good. Okay, a few more days left in um, America now. Um, and we're going to try and wrap up um, these videos. Okay. Excellent. Um, today we're going to start with um, Jim Crow laws. Okay. And then we're going to um, segue into uh, the third Holocaust. Uh, we've spoken about two already. Um, the first being, or the first we've spoken about being uh, that period, 1640 to 1645. Where all the black males were disappeared. And the second was of 1712. Second, 1712, one of the first open periods where the terrorism was, was, was um, I mean, horrible terrorism began to be pushed against the black slaves. And I think we, we kind of covered that pretty well. Yeah, instigate, instigated, incubated, and accelerated by Willie Lynch. By Willie Lynch. Yeah. Okay, but uh, today we're going to talk about Jim Crow laws. Would you like to um, just start it off from the beginning? Well, the Jim Crow period began after the Reconstruction period and when blacks had wrestled back uh, the, the progress that the blacks had made after slavery. We had had a governor after that period, the governor of Louisiana was, was a black man at one point. We had black senators, black representatives, um, and, and, and then the whole country got together, the, the North, the South, and they made an agreement that began the, the, the rather rapid uh, return to a form of slavery, though it wasn't called that. It was called Jim Crow, and this was um, actually a person. Right. named after them. However, it, what it was was a period where the laws, the Ku Klux Klan, um, uh, just, I mean, they just grew in size. They were a, they were a group of, of people. Every state had a chapter. White men dressed in robes, uh, riding horses through black areas, killing at will, terrorizing at will, lynching at, at will. In fact, the idea of, the, of um, robes, white robes and hoods, uh, have a history in in your part of the world in in Europe, uh, the Night Riders as such. So it it is it wasn't something that was invented here in America. It came that 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 kind of thing came with the whites from Europe. And um, what it was was an attempt to just keep the black in what was called his place. And there were all kinds of foolish laws put into effect, but the country codified them. And, uh, and, and put them into effect. For instance, blacks could, black, and this is black males, very little was issued after the black female. It's not that she was not targeted. In fact, this was targeted so that she would become dependent upon the white man. But uh, the way it was done was by terrorizing the black husband, the black male in the family, making him appear weak. But there were things like you couldn't look white people in the eye, you couldn't walk on the same side of the, the sidewalk in town. In fact, where I lived, there were only a day or two when we could actually go to town to do shopping. Um, and that was in the 50s. So Jim Crow was a very long span of time um, from the period after Reconstruction, 1860 to 1880, and all the way up until to my lifetime. And so I actually saw some of it, mm. though my parents kept us pretty uh, separated from it. We simply never went to town. Yeah. So the laws, it, it, to me, what is most important was the effect that they had. Right. Fear, constant fear. Mm. You never knew where some kind of attack would come. Mm. We had separate schools. You, 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 you separated because bef after slavery, Really, many of the blacks and whites began to go to new schools. There had been no public schools in the United States until after the black ex-slave began to demand it. There was an organization, well, it was Congress put it together, a thing called um, the um, 
it was an organization, it, it was a, a, a department uh, like the Department of Indian Affairs, but it was created just for the blacks. And the blacks had some control of it. There was money set aside, and um, the blacks were the ones who demanded public schooling, public hospitals. There were none in the United States at that time. The rich had their school, but the poor had nothing. And it was the freeing of the black and his decision that he needed some education in order to function in this society. He asked for it. And so the whites usurped that. Many of the white universities today began with money that was set aside for black schooling and education. So, uh, but we'll, we'll just stay in, our, in, our, in, in the period uh, when this terrorism went on. Um, I mean, young kids, there was a famous case where, where a young kid was visiting his relatives. He lived in Chicago, came down to, uh, I guess it was Mississippi, and it was claimed that he whistled at a white woman. Well, they... Uh, abducted this young man, tortured him, they castrated him, of course, and, and they beat him mercilessly, and they tied him up and threw him in a river. Eventually, the body was found. I think one of the men that, were, that participated in it, or was simply there, um, uh, uh, talked to someone, and, and some black person heard it, and they found the pond and drained it, and there was his body. It was a uh, Jet magazine did a great story on it. If you look up through the history of Jet, you will see the pictures of this young man. And his mother insisted that they be shown. Uh, that began to send a shock wave through uh, through America, because remember, all of this happened in the South. It was happening during a time when new technologies were coming online. There were no TVs. There was minimal radio. So uh, northern people or western people kind of had it, had it good. They never heard about the horrors of Jim Crow and what was going on. But this began to turn their conscience. However, it didn't stop. As you said, uh, we, we went on to a period when in the 20s when they needed somebody to... To, uh, to actually slave and make this turpentine, yes. Now, just to put this into context, because as always, uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of information uh, being spoken about here. Mm -hmm. But just in terms of psychology, the psychological effect yes. of Jim Crow, we're saying that you, as a human being, step out of your house. Mm -hmm. You have an instant fear of your environment and your surroundings. Yes. You can't look another human being in the face, in right. the eyes, which is very, very normal. You supposedly can't walk on certain sides of the road. Exactly. So imagine that. You're walking down the street and then the thought of possibly you being on the wrong side of the road comes into your mind. Something so normal, uh, as, as normal as that, should I say, and you're not able to do it. Mm -hmm. If you're walking down the street and you become thirsty and you see a water fountain. Oh, you could most definitely not drink from it. As they were white, it was uh, whites only. Uh, water fountains, you'd have to go miles away to find water. Oh, there may be a, a fountain over there, but it was a decrepit thing, right? and it might be marked colored, mm. or nigger, mm -hmm. one of those. Mm -hmm. I saw these things when I grew up. Yeah. That's why when blacks traveled, they always took, took their own water, right. their own food. Where else were they going to get it? Yeah. So, that kind of thing will uh, initiate uh, oh, a paranoia. paranoia, of course. Yeah. And it's not just paranoia. I mean, it's, it's just fear. It's fear. It's, it's justified fear. Just, fear. There you go. And that's the thing about something like paranoia. As soon as you say the word paranoia, you, you think it's something stemming... From the individual who's holding it. There you go. 
However, but this came from the outside and it was justified. Right. And another reason why it's justified is what we're going to go on to now, which is the, the, the third Holocaust, uh, which took place in the, in the period around about the 1920s. Yes, yeah, so in the time that uh, Lindbergh was famous, okay. the, uh, the Wrights brothers were doing their work, uh, and, and the airplane had been made, but it simply hadn't been developed. Yeah. And, and the, the Hindenburg, the great uh, disaster of the Hindenburg. Which, is, which was a, a big air... Airship. Airship, which, which blew up. Uh, if, if, you, if, you go, if you go and search for... The Hindenburg. Yeah. Um, you'll see this, this huge explosion... Uh, many people died. Falling from the air, because the ships were huge. They were huge, they were huge. And they came across the Atlantic. Yeah. They, they flew all over the world, mm -hmm. and there were huge compartments under them. You had berths yeah. for for sleeping, yeah. kitchens for cooking food, mm -hmm. dining rooms. Yeah. So they were huge ships. Now, those airships were also known as blimps. Um, they are less often seen in... The UK and Europe now, uh, but during the 80s and 90s, they were often used uh, as advertising uh, yes. vehicles. Um, we still use them as such. Okay. Uh, the one which is probably most f uh, familiar and well known in the UK is the, the Goodyear. And the Goodyear blimp Goodyear still blimp. flies here. We have Excellent. several here that on each coast. A, a football game or something is going on down in Miami, all over the country. And you can look up and you'll see the blimp. Mm -hmm. Now, the blimp and also the music form known as Boogie Woogie are two key components of this particular holocaust. Now, Mr. Parker, would you like to just try and bring these things together and, and let us um, enable us to understand how these things are related? Okay. Uh, first of all, an industry developed for processing and making turpentine. Right. Turpentine is made from the logs and the remains of pine trees. Okay. In the south, southwest, we have huge forests of pine trees. Right. Now, most people should be familiar with turpentine because it's, it's, a, it's a household... It's a household cleaning product. There household, you go. Very useful. So very useful. Very useful. But you don't often think of where it comes where from. Where it came from. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's first use here... Uh, the great southwestern forest between uh, uh, between uh, Marshall, Texas, and Dallas, Texas, and um, along the border of of uh, Louisiana and and Texas, where, where Shreveport, Louisiana, is. That's the larger city near my home, where I grew up. Right. Um, so what would happen was eventually, you know, the the big blip hangers were there. There were no more blimps. The, bl the blimps had been either destroyed or disassembled. But the hangars remained. And in fact, the, the foundations of them still remain today in those areas. They can be found and witnessed. Um, WEBE, a, a public radio station that actually has a relationship with your, your British broadcasting, did a story on it a year or so ago. And uh, w what happened was they needed men to process this stuff. And they processed it inside of the hangars. Hangars are several acres of space inside the hangar. Yeah. So it's, it's a huge, huge structure. Mm -hmm. And what they would do is they would they first just started with chain gangs. You know, men who were in jail, they, they would have them in there doing this very dangerous, toxic work. But there simply were not enough men. So what they, they did under the Jim Crow laws, they began to arrest black men, mostly young black men, for menial things, or they would make up something. You're walking along the wrong side of the road. And by the way, the wrong side of the road would change from time to time, so you never knew what was wrong or right. right. And uh, what began to happen was the families would, would have these young, young men go missing, and they began to inquire about them. And of course, something like that eventually, you just can't keep it quiet because of the way work is divided in the South. So, me as a young black man, oh, yes. stepping out of my home, possibly to go to work, possibly to go get some groceries. Or to go out on a Saturday night. And I just get abducted. You would disappear. Disappeared. 
Yeah. Just like that. Just like that. Nobody gives your family notice of anything. No. Right. And if anybody uh, knows about or is aware of, of missing persons, uh, firstly, they're very rare uh, when they're reported. Uh, but also, the effects on the family are, are devastating. Devastating. You know, firstly, you, you have somebody who's 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 gone away and you have no idea you where they are. You may think to, oh, these young boys, they're just going on their way. They're yeah. going off partying somewhere. Mm -hmm. But another part of the family will say, well, he's never done this this before. Right. And there's no reason for yeah. this to happen. Why hasn't he returned? So they began to search. Yeah. And disappearance is one thing. Uh, death is another. Death is another. Death is, is, is a horrible thing. But you, at least you have the opportunity to mourn. When somebody's been disappeared, many people think they're dead. But there's part of uh, the, 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 the hope uh, in, the, in the, the psychology of a person that will believe that person is still alive. Yes. Then you'll have other members saying, let them go. It's time to mourn. And that will cause... Oh, the families. All. Even the families will get into all kinds of fights. The uh, family relationships will break up over this. Yeah. Now, if you're somebody who's seen this in the media, you you will follow it. If there's somebody who's been missing for ten years, you'll remember this person who's been mm -hmm. missing for ten years. Uh, but it's a, it's a rare occurrence. But imagine if this is happening almost on a daily basis oh, to yes. a to uh, one uh, social demographic, the, the 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 black family. This mm -hmm. is happening daily. Can you imagine the the, the, the repercussions and the effects that that can have. Oh yes, I can imagine it because mm. it happened to one of my uncles or two of them and my grandfather had to go and um, put his land in Hawk to pay a uh, ransom to get them out. Right. And from that period on, while this was going on, um, you know, young black men began to not go out alone. They would not leave their areas. You had to carry weaponry with you all the time. You had to be ready to defend yourself. Mm. So this was a, 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 a this was a devastating period to many families, and some of them never recovered the bodies because uh, uh, processing um, uh, this 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 oil is a very toxic process, and many people died there. Now. These young men were, were, were sequestered in these structures. And so they, they entertained themselves. Right. And as you have mentioned, uh, the art form Boogie Woogie right. was actually formed and made there in these hangars by these men who were, that's what they, they had nothing to do to entertain themselves. And Boogie Woogie is mostly played on an old upright piano. Yeah. And I and believe sometimes old pianos were, were, were thrown into these uh, They were just thrown out as garbage around and about. People would just get rid of old pianos. Well, the men would, would bring them in, attempt to, to, to repair them. And but all, often most, they would have missing keys. Oh, most always they would have missing keys and they could never get all of them to work properly. So if you've heard the beat of Boogie Woogie, you will know what I'm talking about. It's a very simplistic... Uh, a musical form. Right. Now it is said that actually Jerry Lee Lewis was the person or was responsible for Boogie Woogie. Yeah, he's often I, named as the, the pioneer of, of uh, Boogie Woogie. And that is exactly, that is absolutely not so. The way Jerry Lee Lewis and his cousin Jimmy Swaggart, who's now uh, a famous dis, a deg uh, uh, He's, a, he's disgraced, he disgraced himself, but he still lives as a minister uh, in, 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 um, around New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, when they were little boys, they would travel with their father, who was an itinerant preacher also, and he would go to these places, uh, you know, doing his preaching, saving souls and all that. Well, when that was all over, the men would, would just go back to playing their music, and Jerry Lee Lewis and his cousin would listen to this music. And they eventually took it out of these hangars and, 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 and took it as their own. Right. So they, they saw that the, the, the black males playing these pianos with the broken keys, missing keys, and they, they were enamored by this yes, particular this sound. Little, it's a very simplistic little sound, mm -hmm. but it's a catching sound. Oh, yeah. 
and you can build others off of the sun. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Jerry Lee Lewis, I'm not implying that they did anything wrong. Right. They were little boys yeah. traveling with their, with their father or their uncle, and they just picked this up. Yeah. Uh, but it's no different than a lot of things that blacks have invented or created that someone else gets the naming for. Right. Yeah. You, know, you can go through history, you can go through General Electric, you can go through any of the great so-called white inventors, and what you will find... Yes, they, it will say they invented this, but often they had black engineers or black men who worked under them, and they would discover something about the filament of the light bulb, for instance, or about the timing of stoplights. They would never get credit for these things. However, um, what was one of the big white inventors, one of the great ones? Because, Thomas Edison. Right. Well, many of his inventions were really not his own. Okay. Um, um, uh, Ford, who is who is the man who brought us the Model T, he actually made, did a lot of made, put a lot of effort in uh, trying to to take uh, Dr. George Washington Carver away from Tuskegee Institute. Just as an example, because he wanted the use of his mind. Dr. Carver is credited with hundreds, if not a thousand or so, inventions. Uh, flour from the peanut. Shoe polish from the peanut. In fact, in World War One, was it in Britain? Um, they they no longer had 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 good foodstuffs for their soldiers, and they heard about a product that Dr. Carver had invented, and they they they, they wrote to him and invited him to um, to they back the invention further, and flour for making bread was invented by Dr. George Washington Carver in Britain, and it helped Britain through the war. And it was only then that the United States began to recognize Dr. George Washington Carver. They knew of him, but at no time did they attempt to, to contact him or to give him credit for his inventions. Over several hundred products just from the peanut alone. So from, from what we've spoken about today, we, we've seen uh, the holoco uh, another holocaust, uh, within a Holocaust, remember, Jim Crow was a Holocaust in itself, and then itself. within that there was this uh, disappearance into these uh, into these large blimp hangers. And this was this was a, a common occurrence. Common occurrence. Oh yeah. Common occurrence. Um, but we also see um, the alteration of history. Yes. And all of this creates this justified fear. Oh, yes. That the black man had. True fear. Uh, but what we've also uh, been made aware of that since the abolition of slavery, the white man has attempted to recreate slavery in different guises. Yes, our white brothers have, have continued this out of their own fear. Right. And I'd like to say something else, too. It's just a little aside. The way my grandfather found out about his sons was we had a relative who passed for white in the area uh, where these blimps were. And he found out what they were. They were a bit away from his farm. And when he found that my uncles were missing, he contacted my grandfather and said, this is probably where they are. Now, he supplied food to the blimp, you know, corn, peas, those kinds of things. But he as he passed as white. However, he was our relation. Right. And I think he saw, it was said he saw um, one of my uncles in this place and that's how he contacted my grandfather. Right. My grandfather had to get a turn, get lawyers um, and, some of, and some of the white lawyers took it up. However, they were also my grandfather's first cousins. Okay. So we were fortunate. But not many other people were in your no, position. No, not many other people were in, in our position. That was a definite fortunate um, cascade of events. Yes, and it had to do with our family and our, and, and our situation in the, in the society there. We had many relatives that were, even if they didn't pass for white, they, white people passed them. Right. And they had a, a rather strange position to get information and pass it around to the black community. 
Now, we've seen um, this particular Holocaust, as I, I said before, um, the Jim Crow laws, uh, but also coming forward uh, through the 20th into the 21st century, uh, we have the, the, the slave um, within the prison. Mm -hmm. The prison is the new plantation, yes. in a way. Um, and they are trying to recreate the, the uh, environment of slavery within the prisons. Yes, well, it's already done. Yeah. In many southern states, there are more black men incarcerated or they have some kind of, uh, they, they're under, uh, what do you call it? Probation. Probation. Right. And under probation, you are limited as to where you can travel, what you can do, when you have to report to a pro probation officer, and you have to pay for it also. Right. Now, there, are, as I said, there are many in some of the southern states, there are more black men either in prison and have their pro and are under these, these strict probationary things, right. lose their right to vote, then there are black men that are legally on the street. Now, we aren't saying that, that, that there are more in prison. We're talking about that whole system. And black men have lost their rights to vote. Right. And that was part of the intention of this. Okay. And this exists today. Mm -hmm. And we see that as a continuation of the attack on the black male. Oh, absolutely. And also the, the destruction of the family unit. Absolutely. This is, uh, all of this is associated with exactly what you're saying, the destruction of the family unit, but it has other unfortunate consequences. Understand that there are only basically 10% of African Americans in this country. They've never been much more. And yet there is this unreasonable fear so-called fear of the 300 million uh, white Americans against this group, and it's gone on from, before the, from the beginning. And you began to see that it's absolutely foolish for a small group of people to generate such fear. There's something else behind this. Right. So what we're trying to do here is just show you uh, sequentially how things have moved uh, on to today. On to today. So the, the, the psychological effects, uh, the emotional effects, the financial and economical effects yeah, see, are economic, continuing today. Economic effects are devastating. Now, if we talk about uh, family uh, history, mm -hmm. um, uh, family heritage, heirlooms, these kind of things, we know that a family's legacy can, can continue for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And any, any um, establishment uh, which has a family connected to it, economically we see that they have strength. Yes. But if we are systematically destroying the family of the black person, and then in 2013 we're seeing them in a... Uh, economically weak position yes this is not merely a coincidence oh it's no coincidence at all, at all. i think there's a, a very famous phrase which um, many people will know uh to get together we stand divided we fall yeah simple phrase and when you're breaking down the black family when you're breaking down the black community generation after generation when you're um always putting them in a position of poverty they don't have the means to get out of it. It's going to, firstly, as Willie Lynch wanted, uh, continue to regenerate itself. Well, Willie Lynch said at the time, um, 1712, when he said to his, his brother white men, let's make a slave. Let's make a slave. And he said that the effects of what he was going to do would last for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And here we are, 300 and so years away from that period and the effects are still going on. Yeah. Blacks against blacks, women against men, fair-skinned blacks and, and uh, are having a, a constantly having a bickering between them. The, so the, the, the hair situation which is so superficial it shouldn't even be spoken about but it's a huge, huge industry here and in your country. Oh yeah, a, a huge industry and a huge uh, stigma. Yes. 
if you don't have the right kind of hair and and the the amount of propaganda which is being pushed on uh, the black female now whereby all of the the, the people who are rep supposedly representing black females have white type hair yes you know if you remember what was it the london olympics when the gabby the, the little black girl who was a gymnast okay in this country she was and you know she got all of the medals right fantastic okay however she didn't have a weave in her hair you know this is a young girl in sports yes and weaves don't do well in activity you sweat we do all these kinds of things and, and women who are wearing it, you know what's, what's involved with the weave. Where in this country, a great uh, controversy went on for several days that she didn't have her hair fixed. Right. It was the most ridiculous thing I had heard. Well, firstly, um, be, living in the UK, didn't hear about this particular controversy. Oh, it was a great controversy. Here. But, as, but as soon as you said it just to me there, the, the, the word that sprung to my mind was ridiculous. 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 But I'm sure within, within the community, it was uh, a big deal. Within the community that was concerned with it, it right. was a huge deal. Right. And she, she needs to get her hair did. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, she's going to be representing the United States on the world's uh, stage. So she needs to, to, to get rid of that black appearing hair. Yeah. You know, yeah. it was the stupidest thing I heard. I must say, I apologize for such a judgment. Mm -hmm. However, it was a stupid. However, that is an after effect of slavery. Right. The hatred of one's self and one's body parts. Right. You're not fair enough, your hair is not straight enough. Right. And if it's not straight enough, it's not the correct color. Mm. And the very unfortunate thing about that is, when such it's negative- the young children. Oh, the yeah. effects it has on the young children, so you're perpetuating that into the next generation yeah. and beyond. But when you're pushing such negative things, negative opinions out into uh, the world at large, people who have no idea about black hair somehow have an opinion of it. Yes. And this is, this is for, for me, what is the crazy thing. So the black people themselves, they, because of uh, a lack of knowledge... Black they, women, yes. Black, they don't know how they should treat their hair. Um, they, they are constantly overusing uh, these weaves and such alike. But then... Other, other demographics will start having the same opinion. Yes. But both are really informed and uh, ill-educated uh, or non-educated about this particular... And about what, what, what this thing. means. What, what it means. Self-hate. Self-hate. You will tear your... No one... And that was, that's what Willie Lynch meant. Right. After his process got, done, got going, mm -hmm. they didn't have to really do it again. No. The, the, the slave itself would perpetuate it. And also they're, they're, they're using different methods. So before it was, it was initially, if we go way back, it was a, uh, a physical um, attack. Yes. But then they realized that they were losing too much of their stock, too much of their slave. So then it changed to a psychological attack. Yes. And then it was an open psychological attack. But now it's a, it's a subtle. covert. It's very subtle. It's through propaganda. It's through media. It's through images. Mm -hmm. It's through television. Mm -hmm. And it's constant. 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 Right? Um, and we're going to follow this video up with just explaining uh, what you need to be aware of um, in terms of what you need to be looking out for. Mm -hmm. Because as we said just now, this onslaught is... Uh, ongoing it's every day mm -hmm. it's every minute of every day yes um, so we're going to wrap this video up uh, and then come back again and just talk about what we would like people to keep an eye out for um, and in their own lives in their own lives how they view themselves and um, just have a few ideas on on how to approach this hopefully we it's can share subject. some tools that the individual can use to, to deprogram himself. That, and that is exactly what they need to do. Deprogram yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Park.